Summer blockbuster season is over, and a lot of movie fans are trading the big screen experience for smaller screens at home. But whether your screen of choice is your computer, tablet, phone, smart TV, or even your internet-enabled popcorn popper, InfoSec wants to make sure that you secure your screen. That's why we've created the free Secure Your Screen Toolkit to produce and direct you and your employees during National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. The toolkit includes one training module and an assessment, five posters to hang on the walls of your screening room, four newsletter templates, four email templates, and an employee presentation so you can save the day by preventing your organization from ending up with a starring role in the next big hacker event. Make InfoSec your best supporting hack preventer. Huh? See what I did by going to infosecinstitute.com slash free to download our free toolkit and help turn the next big hacker heist into a box office flop this October. Look, I'm not going to ask you why you have an internet enabled popcorn popper. I know we all bought some weird stuff during a lockdown, but I will ask you to learn to secure your screens and secure your devices by going to infosecinstitute.com slash free. One more time, rule of threes, that's infosecinstitute.com slash free. And now, lights, camera, take action. Let's start the show. Today on Cyberwork, I'm honored to welcome Leslie Carhart of Dragos, an AKA hack for pancakes on social media. Leslie is a lifelong breaker and builder of things, and their insight on the deep mechanics of industrial control systems are an absolute must hear for any of you considering this space or even dipping your toe in it. Leslie also talks about their keynote at this year's Blue Team Con in Chicago, the difference between incident response in the military versus the private sector, and why standard cybersecurity studies won't take you as far in the ICS space as it will to learn how train switchers work. Seriously, this is one of the best episodes I've ever been a part of, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So keep it right here for this week's episode of Cyberwork. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Leslie Carhart is a Chicago-based digital forensics and incident response professional specializing in investigations of industrial control systems networks. Uh, they currently work for the industrial control cybersecurity company Dragos Inc. Is it Dragos? Dragos? Sorry. It's Dragos. <laughs> Dragos. It's Dragos. Got it. Okay, uh, Dragos Inc., uh, which investigates intrusions into utilities, manufacturing, and transportation systems. Leslie speaks, teaches, and blogs about the topic around the world. In their free time, Leslie runs a virtual conference, as well as resume resume and career clinics for cybersecurity job seekers, as well as teaching small kids to kick things. Uh, and hopefully not their parents. Uh, they are honored to have received awards like DEF CON's Hacker of the Year and SAN's Difference Maker Lifetime Achievement. Uh, so we're going to talk to Leslie today about their uh, career, cybersecurity career journey and uh, the work that they do, as well as uh, the upcoming Blue Team Con that's happening in Chicago uh, the weekend of August 25th, 26th, 27th. So Leslie, thanks so much for joining me today and welcome to Cyberwork. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, glad to hear that. So um, I always like to introduce our guests to our listeners by asking them about their security journey. Uh, in some cases, uh, my guests come to uh, cybersecurity later in life or they work in areas of cybersecurity that aren't as tech focused. But in your case, it's pretty clear that your passion for such complex, never changing disciplines uh, as incident response and computer forensics and ICS security has been a big part of your life for a long time. So what was the initial draw towards computers and tech and security? Do you remember how old you were when you first really got interested in these things? And what was your first experience that set it all off? Yeah, so I get asked this all the time because I do a lot of podcasts and speaking and mm -hmm. I almost hate telling my story because it's so stereotypical, so so prototypical, but it's really not. I've done 230 of these. I, I've, you know, I, I, yeah. if it's, yeah, it, they, they, they all, they, they do run together, but that's quite all right because we want to hear yours. That's true, you know, but yeah. there are a lot of people out there and I know probably more of my friends than aren't in cybersecurity have very non-standard journeys into cybersecurity. Mm. They were bartenders, mm -hmm. they were home List. They were in the military and they touched their first computer at 22. So I have this, this very generic stereotypical story, which really isn't the norm, especially in my demographic and my age group. So I don't want people to think like they have to do what I did. But um, I grew up on a farm in Illinois and uh, 
uh, when I was seven or eight years old, my father bought a computer at the time, $7,000 lease for a computer because that was the era um, to do inventory and accounting for the farm. And uh, I got an interest in that. I've always been very interested in how stuff works and taking things apart. I always ask for something that does stuff for my birthday, nothing in particular. I just had to do something. So yeah. I got really interested in this computer and I learned how to program. I learned basic at like eight years old. And, uh, you know, I had two choices. Look, we didn't have a lot of money and I was on a farm and I could learn to farm mm-hmm. or I could learn to use the computer. And given that I incinerate in sunlight, I decided to um, (laughs) learn how to use the computer really well and solder things and build programs and got hired on for my first programming job when I was 15 years old because I knew how to code very well. And it was a very different time Um, back in the dot com boom where nobody knew how to program. And if you knew how to code, you could get a job. So so my my story is very different than people's today. of course, the dot-com bubble burst. I had very few alternatives at, at that point after being a screw-up, big-shot, computer hacker crowd person in, in the 90s, then to join the military. And of course, wanting to do computer stuff, I got a job in the military doing backshop soldering on aircraft computers. And I learned how to do that. So I kind of got the industrial computer background there. And I mean, I, I've been involved in the in the community and in the space for a very, very long time. I always wanted to do investigative stuff because I find it very interesting, even since I read very early papers on it in the 90s. And eventually I kind of ended up in a, <laughs> I left behind that life of crime and uh, I got a legitimate job in cybersecurity and moved into the space I wanted to be in. And that is a long-winded, very stereotypical story of my life. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, you're about my 230th guest here and 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 stereotyped is, is you know, is, is a loose word for, you know, I mean, like I said, there's just so there's so many variants in there. I mean, uh, yes, lots of people got a Commodore 64 early on. Yes, lots of people, uh, you know, broke things around the house so they could repair them and stuff. But the, the, the fact that it was uh, on a farm, for instance, is very interesting and that you chose uh, the activity of the two that would move you to other places i mean did you have a sense of i mean apart from the sort of like you said not not wanting to be around you know outside and sunlight and whatnot did you have a feeling of like wanting to see the world or see other things was that natural curiosity also extended to um things outside of the computer so you were there but not everybody who's listening was there in the 90s there was this sense in the late 90s in the dot com boom that anything was possible and, mm-hmm. and like the matrix movies they say like this is the heyday of human society it felt like that at the time before like the dot com crash before the 2008 recession and then the pandemic and social strife and things like that in the late 90s it felt like we were on the star trek the next generation past mm-hmm. the future Um, I mean, there were still problems. There were societal problems. There were problems with human rights. There was conflict in the world. But from a tech perspective and from the culture that we were in as computer hackers, it really felt like we were on the brink of something very new and novel. And we were, but it wasn't as all as utopian as we had hoped. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, of course, you wanted to be involved with that. It was an exciting new frontier. And we were going to go live in the Matrix skyscrapers. And, you know, anything Mm -hmm. was possible. Yep. Yeah, I mean, can you? I say this a lot, and I'm sure my uh, audience is tired of hearing me saying it. But there, I, I just remember in the late '90s there was a feeling that the internet was still something exclusive, and that there was a, a, an idea that not everyone was ever going to get on the internet. I mean, can you speak to, um, how, you know, that that sort of, you know, like you said, it, it felt like the future, but it also felt like something that was kind of its own space and also kind of a hobby that was for for specialized people like can you talk about i mean and like you said this this sort of toxicity that's happened in the meantime you know as everyone you know as it becomes very very easy to get on i mean i'm not calling for gatekeeping or anything like that but you mean can you talk about the the, just the the way that the internet felt at the time well there was a lot of toxicity and gatekeeping then too it's very very hard to find a mentor that was one of the reasons that i have invested so much of my life into getting people into the field is because nobody helped me a lot Mm -hmm. of people tried to keep me out and make me miserable Mm -hmm. Uh, so Mm -hmm. that's why i do what i do um you know that's 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 what it's all about but yeah um yeah, I mean, yeah, it it was a 
niche community, the the mm-hmm. people that you knew. I mean, I wasn't always accepted into it. Yeah. That was that was part of it, but it, it did feel like you were you cyberpunk. You felt really cyberpunk being part yeah. of the hacker community at the time, and like. God, everything was wide open. Like, you know, like back then, like system security was practically non-existent and Mm -hmm. everything was being explored and people weren't just getting thrown in jail right away for breaking into things. So um, it was a very, very different time. And, you know, it's good times now. It's different. A lot of the DP has gone away. It's become Mm -hmm. a lot easier to get into this field. Um, You don't have to fight the same battles and deal with the same crap all the time that I did at the same level. Mm -hmm. It's still there, but it, things have been proved. So, no yes, it was it was a nostalgic time, but there's things that have definitely improved over the last 25 years. Mm-hmm. Oh, couldn't agree more. Couldn't couldn't agree more. I, I guess I was thinking more in terms of of just the sort of like pitchfork <laughs> mobs that weren't there just because of scale and whatnot. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's very yeah. very different. Very different in that regard. Uh, and I definitely want to talk to you more about, um, you know, the current times and things that are better and things that are, are worse and things that are uh, just different. But I want to kind of get back to your career journey first, if you don't mind. So uh, mm-hmm. your first uh, extended position after, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, will, I go through people's LinkedIn files. It's 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 compulsive. I don't, uh, think, I I don't know how far mine really goes back. It goes back. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Your first extended position, it looks like, was incident response uh, lead, team lead for Motorola. Uh, and I want to come back to that for a minute. But as you said before, from 2007 through 2021, uh, 15 years, you served in the U.S. Air Force Reserve, uh, first as a network infrastructure technician, and then a position uh, called cyber transport. And I thought I'd heard all the cyber role names, but this one's new to me. So can you tell me more about cyber transport and what that role means from your time in the Air Force Reserve? Yeah, so to to clarify the stuff on LinkedIn, I enlisted in 2001. My first day out of basic training in electronic school was September 11th, 2001. So yeah. mm-hmm. um, um, I have all the luck in the world. Um, so so I retired from the Air Force in 2021, actually. Okay. Um, and let's see. So um, cyber transport, the military likes to stick cyber on anything because it gets you dollars and cents. And For cyber sure. transport is network engineering. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, so um, can you talk a little bit about how that particular type of work informed some of the other things that you were doing around incident response and and, and your other positions? No, I don't. I don't know if it did. I was already in that field. I was already okay. doing cybersecurity parallel with that. You know. Gotcha. I can talk all day about if you are thinking about joining the guard or the, the reserve, which oh, one please. you should do, which branch you should do. Like that's something that I can definitely counsel people on, and it's something I do all the time. It's an interesting beast, and it's not for everyone. But it is, if it is for you, like that's a great way to get some training, like to get some legitimate training in cybersecurity or in other areas of IT. There's been a focus on moving everybody out of normal IT and into cybersecurity in a lot of places. Um, but uh, when you are in the Guard or the Reserves, you're kind of trying to find a slot that works for you. Unlike the active duty military where they typically just put you somewhere, in the Guard or the Reserves, you actually apply for jobs and you try to find something typically that balances out with what you do every day because you can't, most reserve work is still a weekend, a month and two weeks a year plus deployments. And it's very hard to like do something completely different, be a, a truck driver or a crew chief or something, and then go to cybersecurity the rest of the time. So most people, after they have decided to do this for 10, 20, 30 years, try to find a position in, in the reserves or the guard where they're doing something similar enough, whatever is open that they can grab that's in a base near them so that you know, you're competent at your job. You don't want to be the dumb reservist. Most people don't want to do that. There's a stigma about guard and reserve people that when they get activated during wartime, they don't know how to do their job. So Mm. if you care about that and you have the integrity to want to be good at what you do, you typically maneuver and move and apply for positions so that you end up in something that's close enough that you know how to do your job well. Okay. So just to make sure I understand that you're, you are basically keeping to similar uh specialties yeah not outside of the reserve so that the work that you do in the reserve that that you're you're uh, situated across the board uh in case I always adjusted what I was doing in the reserves to what I was doing full time I see 
I see. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of uh, a lot of students who uh, are it, both in the military or considering the military and then the federal mm -hmm. sector and so forth. So I always appreciate those insights. Yeah, I'm always uh, happy to talk about that, too. Nice. Uh, so as, as mentioned before, from 2010 through 2008, uh, you worked for Motorola Solutions and Incident Response. Uh, and since 2018, you've been in charge of Incident Response with Dragos Inc., uh, participating in a variety of disciplines around Incident Response, including Incident Command, Digital, Computer, Memory Forensics, and my personal favorite thing to talk about on the show, ICS Security. So uh, can you tell me about the types of Incident Response that you worked on at Motorola and like what specifically that... What, what type of, you know, incident response work you do for Motorola and then how you carried those uh, experiences with you uh, to Dragos? Yeah, I mean, within the, the boundaries of NDAs. Um, of course. Yeah. Um, so I've always been in the kind of ICS incident response space. That's my niche. So working mm -hmm. with and to clarify again for people who aren't you and I. Um, when I'm talking about industrial control systems, I'm talking about non-standard computer systems. So things that yeah. run industrial processes. So um, things that move basically or heat up or cool down or increase pressure, lower pressure, make a physical impact on the world. So think mm -hmm. about power plants, think about manufacturing lines, think about, um, you know, uh, water treatment, transportation, those types of computer systems. I did that in the Air Force. I did that at Motorola. I do that at Dragos. Um, in a very, very specialized way. And doing cybersecurity in those spaces is very, 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 very different um, for a lot of reasons that we can talk about. But there's uh, different technologies in play. There's different security tools. There's different knowledge you need. You need to do operations and all the different areas of cybersecurity very differently in those spaces. Mm -hmm. But it's always been interesting to me because it's a very real impact in the world. And ethics and what I'm doing every day matters a lot to me. So I've always leaned toward jobs where... You know, if I wasn't doing my job and somebody hacked into something, somebody could really get hurt. So um, Motorola, of course, has a wide range of industrial technologies, um, industrial control technologies, radio over IP, 911 systems, mm -hmm. and of course, all their own manufacturing plants. So I was doing both consulting and internal incident response at Motorola Solutions and heavily centered around stuff that isn't normal Windows or Mac computers, um, those kinds of control devices. And that's kind of the space that I fell into. And, and then I moved to Dragos where I do that in a much, much more specialized way. I only do industrial technology incident response there. I only work with those systems. So power, water, oil and gas, transportation, things like that. Yeah. Oh, the, you're... I, you're 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 ringing my bells here. I'm I'm absolutely I'm actually th thrilled to. And you specifically said the things that I like to say on this show is that you you know our I, ICS practitioners, security practitioners are making tangible improvements to their own neighbor, you know, their own communities or yeah. wherever they choose to do the work. And you know, we've had a couple of different ICS people on here, and the thing they all say is that there's just this swath of industrial control systems with low security or just lack of funding, you know, and it's a lot of like just waiting for the moment, you know, and it, it almost there's that feeling of like, well, once the disaster hits, then we'll be able to finally have enough funding to actually put the security in place, which is, you know, terrifying. And, um, you know, and one of the things that we've talked about regularly is if you're wanting to get into this, like you could maybe, you know, volunteer in your community, you know, if you have an underfunded, uh, you know, municipality or something like that. But um, so that's I'm I'm thrilled to be talking about that with you. But um, uh, as, as I'm going to lead into your uh, what you just said there um, for the past month, uh, specifically, you've become Dragos's technical director of uh, industrial incident response. Uh, so I, I love talking about that kind of stuff. And it looks from here like one of the most foundational ways, uh, like I said, the cybersecurity professional can actively help their community become more secure against potentially catastrophic cyber attacks and community harm. So, um, yeah, can you talk about uh, how this this works with Dragos? Because I know that this is kind of I think it said you're you're like the sort of like North American director of ICS. Is that right or no? Um, well, I did move into a new position recently, um, yeah. which is the technical director position. Yeah. And what I'm doing is incident response uh, technology development and strategy for, okay. for we do consulting yes. incident response. Of course, we do retainer incident response right. okay. for industrial networks. And yeah. uh, I'm focusing more on the strategy and developing programs around that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, does that, that, that I suppose that means that you 
do less of the actual sort of like hands-on work of it. I mean, you've probably been moving towards the, uh, you know, like the larger scale uh, planning like this for a while now. I mean, uh, can you talk about maybe like the the sort of steps? Because I imagine when you start doing ICS, like you're specifically securing this power plant or this water, you know, main, and and now it seems like now you're thinking in larger scales in terms of, uh, you know, here's a here's an overarching policy for this this sort of area or this industry or something like that. Yeah. So um, we do retainer based incident response. So mm -hmm. we get called up when one of our customers has an incident. That's what we do specifically. Um, so so that's what we do as a team is we dispatch out to do response. We don't do their monitoring. We don't do their, their threat hunting unless they engage us to do like an hour based threat hunt. But mm -hmm. we do incident response when there is a, a cybersecurity incident in an industrial facility and in, across a multitude of verticals and organization sizes. Um, I still very much do casework. Um, okay. There's, okay. there's a, a, a surplus of casework, especially yeah. during certain large scale campaigns. Um, but there's also a need to look at how to do this stuff, um, not necessarily just leading a team, but also looking at how you do incident response in these spaces, because it we are the first company to ever do a dedicated practice to industrial incident response. So nobody's written a playbook for this before. And the kinds of calls we get when we get calls, the ratio of calls to downtime completely different than doing, and all of my team has worked in incident response in other consulting organizations before. Everything is completely different in ICS. The scale of time between something happening and us getting called is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, what we get called in about and in what scenarios we get called in is completely different. And the priorities of the organizations are completely different as well. So we're going to, we're having to write the playbook for doing this from the ground up. And that's a lot of what I'm doing when I'm not on engagements is trying to develop the technologies and the strategies and the, you know, even like the the staffing and logistics of how to handle this, because it's, it's so much less of a predictable space. And it's so totally different from any models that exist right now for doing consulting incident response. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, you mentioned it before, but the, with all the sort of legacy systems and and a lot of the kind of workarounds you'll have to do, or or security you have to set in that has to be sort of mindful of like precise timings and 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 other things. I mean, there's it just sounds fascinating. It's 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 way above my level, but it sounds like like such a like a again, like you said, like a hands on you know, learn a thing from the inside out, a thing that does a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that's very exciting um, and. I, I'm honestly going to sleep 10% better tonight knowing that there's a, a consulting, you know, because again, I, every single time I've talked to this, it seems like it's a game of whack-a-mole. It's like, well, we we stopped, you know, Old Smart, but there's going to be another one soon and they might not have a dedicated as dedicated a person. I mean, that was, you know, someone was there's on the job and saw it the happening. In the, no, sorry, go ahead. So there's a lot going on that the public doesn't see. Um, yeah. There's a lot going on that the public doesn't see. There's a lot going on that nobody in cybersecurity sees because nobody's monitoring to report it. But there's mm -hmm. stuff that gets reported to us that people keep very, very quiet because mm -hmm. in those spaces, it's still considered there's a stigma about admitting you've had an incident. So yeah. there's a lot going on in those spaces right now. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I mean, that that would be a whole episode uh, right in there. So, um, so yeah, like I said, my my listeners are already tearing their hair out because I'm I'm talking about Oldsmar again. But um, uh, I want to sort of turn it over to you in terms of um, talking, you know, state of ICS, state of the industry. Um, can you tell me some of the industrial control attacks or emergencies that you've seen arise in the aftermath of some of the the big name new story examples that we saw over the past couple of years? Um, has has Apart from your own consulting business, has the uh, greater greater scrutiny on ICS systems over the past few years either seen cyber attackers changing or refining their tactics or maybe hopefully more new cyber professionals entering the, the field hoping to make a difference? A little bit of all of that. Um, I if, first of all, let's start with what's what's going on in the in the ICS and in, in incident mm -hmm. response space. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So I divide the casework that we get into three general categories. The first one is commodity. So ransomware still impacts industrial networks. It doesn't impact the low level. PLCs, RTUs, the low-level devices. But what it does is it screws up the Windows computers. And mm -hmm. Windows computers have a big presence because of IT, OT, convergence of those technologies. Yeah. 
there's a lot of Windows computers, especially legacy Windows computers in industrial environments. And they're not controlling the process, but they're doing important stuff like showing the displays that the operators use to see what's going on. So getting those ransomed can cause situations where they have to shut down operations because they can't see or control what's happening in the process. Even though things are still running safely right. for now, they can't tell. So there's a safety concern. They have, so it's very disruptive. And yeah. it's, you know, that's can still cause loss of production, um, you know, and sometimes if you have to rapidly shut down a process that can have other physical impacts on restarting it later. So um, there's that certainly. Um, so commodity malware, both deployed by uh, worms and deployed by human adversaries just trying to make money, definitely still a big thing. They are definitely targeting industrial networks more, industrial operators more, because they they know that people have to you have those things. So yeah. like, just like they're targeting hospitals more. Yeah, like, there's, there's no bluffing. Yeah, <laughs> you can't. Uh, there's possibly, and, and there's everybody's numbers debate. And I have a big problem with like people throwing out figures about the number of attacks happening in the world each year, because nobody has a full picture. Like there's a lot of stuff that never gets caught. There's a lot of stuff that only one cybersecurity company sees, and then another one sees some other stuff. But in general, it seems to be that there's less ransomware attacks lately, slightly. Mm -hmm. it, the trend line is going down overall. But what I'm seeing is more precision towards targeting things that will actually pick out. So they have to get smarter, too. You know, they're they're in there to make, it, to make money as well uh, and be efficient at it. So um, that's one category. Mm -hmm. And the second category is insiders, both unintentional and intentional insiders in these mm -hmm. industrial facilities. Um, and that includes, so intentional ones are... You know, nobody knows how to wreck an industrial process. Breaking something in a specific way, setting something on fire in an industrial process is hard. There's lots of safety controls in place to prevent that. Um, but nobody knows how to break things better than the people who actually work on those systems. Mm -hmm. So somebody gets laid off, they don't get a raise, something else is going on, and they decide to cause some damage. They can certainly do that. Um, that's certainly a, a possible thing that somebody can do, and we do see it. Um, we've had cases where we had to have the police escort us into a site because hmm. people were going to get violent over, you know, who did it, who did what, who to blame. Wow. Um, so there's those, but there's also unintentional insiders. And like, we do cybersecurity for like remote mines in, in the Arctic Circle and like, you know, like oil platforms. And people sometimes want to watch a movie or something at mid, in the middle of the night on their shift or, you know, they'll show somebody their photos and they plug something in or they bridge a system or they put in a wireless yeah. access, point, access point they shouldn't um, or they really want to access something from home we have to go without having to go in and they expose RDP to the internet and it gets mm. you know, scanned, it's on Shodan. That happens all the time too. And they aren't meaning mm. to do harm. They're just trying to live their lives, but they're breaking yeah. policy potentially. But they, in the end, it causes an incident and we have to deal with that. Um, or a potential incident, at least, and we have to investigate it. And then the final, the third category of cases we do are the more state style adversaries who are doing much more nefarious things. Um, some of them are getting caught because somebody's looking. A lot of them aren't getting caught. A lot of lot more aren't getting reported because nobody wants to admit it. Um, and most of that is stuff that doesn't make the news because it's pre-staging for the future. Um, mm -hmm. Reconnaissance, foothold yeah. building establishing footholds and systems, stealing documentation, screenshots of HMI displays um, so that they can potentially launch an attack much easier in the future if there's a geopolitical reason to do that. Um, so there's that going on as well. There's an undercurrent of that. And that's much more challenging because unlike ransomware that's very visible, it's not something that gets, dollar, gets dollars and cents for a security program. It doesn't make the New York Times usually. Um, you know, that's that's stuff that we don't know the full scale of what's happening because like there's underfunded municipalities that have zero monitoring that are being used yeah. as test beds. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to do free monitoring for municipalities to try to get, first of all, to get them more secure, but second of all, to get eyes out there and understand yeah. what those adversaries are doing on a broader stick of scale because they are absolutely pre-positioning to do tactical, strategic things if they have a cause to in the future. Of course they are. Everybody with that capability in the world is trying to build those capabilities in potential adversaries. So um, there's that. And so those are kind of the, the categories of incidents that we're responding to right now. And um, 
Yeah. I mean, in terms of the space of where we're at, um, there's a couple of things happening. So IT OT convergence has been happening for a long time now. So the mm-hmm. last 15, 20 years, we've been seeing more and more IT technologies and networking and connectivity get pulled into these environments because it saves money and it's cheaper. Of course, they're going to do it. Um, especially with the pandemic, a lot of stuff was connected to remote access that wasn't before. Yeah. Um but there's also a divergence in skills, which is very problematic for me because um, a lot of the systems that I have to do forensics on, there's no agents, there's no XDR, EDR, next gen, anything in a lot of these environments, most okay. of these environments, um, for a reason. Because the more stuff you add onto this book, this industrial process, the more likely is something will make it fail and somebody will die. It needs to be simple. It needs to work as a whole, as a functional unit. Um, so, so they're simple for a reason and they don't get upgraded for a lot for a reason, because when you hit the big red button on the wall to do the emergency stop, it has to work right away. Mm -hmm. If you add encryption, if you add more layers of software and intermediate devices, every one of those is a point of failure where somebody's limb is caught in a machine, you hit the button and it doesn't stop. Mm. I try to convey that to people. You never want to cause worse consequences in industrial cybersecurity than the adversaries might. Um, so we deal with that, but we're not only dealing with like the lack of security tooling, we're dealing with tons of legacy systems because again, these systems have to work. So if there's a 286 in there and it's working, you know, it's a big deal to to change the system over safely and test everything and make everything reintegrate safely uh, to replace it. So upgrading the system, you don't just swap out windows. You don't just upgrade a computer. Like no. everything has to be tested and work safely. Um, but that means I have to do forensics in that. So yeah. like I've run into Windows NT and Windows 95 and Linux from 2006 and stuff like that. And not all our forensics tools today even work on that stuff. And when we get people who are coming out of college who just graduated with a cybersecurity degree, they didn't learn how to do traditional forensics mm-hmm. on like Windows XP computers, Windows 95. They learned how to use XDR and EDR, just like people do in SOX today when they get their entry level cybersecurity mm-hmm. jobs. So we have a big challenge in finding and training people who can learn to do like hardcore traditional digital forensics and response and deal with all those nuances of like, what the heck is this hard drive connector and how do I build a cable? I've got a soldering iron in my kit. Like, yeah. um, do I have to build a cannon plug to connect to this thing? So there's a divergence in skills too in cybersecurity between IT and OT, and that's becoming more and more problematic for us. So that's kind of the state of things. Boy, that yeah. was long-winded. How, how did how did, how did I do on your uh, here, here, Here's the good news is I want to keep going with that Ooh. because that was literally my next question. Um, and you, you started going into it, but I want to get... Uh, yeah. Even more precise, because, you know, a big part of cyber work, the, the podcast here is lowering the barrier of entry. So I think something like that, uh, you know, people could be interested in getting into uh, ICS systems. But that, you know, sounds a little scary. So, uh, you know, and and like, well, I'm I'm learning this, but I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't have a soldering iron in my kit right now and whatever. So I, I, I wanted to have you sort of talk to people who are excited about this, who maybe are thinking of getting into this, starting their their studies uh, or are even just dipping their toe in thinking maybe this is the stuff for me. Like, what are some of the the concrete skills, like you just said now, uh, you know, uh, learning forensics, learning legacy systems? What would you recommend someone getting into this space now, apart from just cybersecurity studies? What else would you recommend uh, that they that they need to know? You've got to break a lot of preconceptions. That's the first thing you've got to be able to do is think outside the box. You've got to be creative and you've got to be adaptable and you've got to be okay with change. Um, because you are going to have to come up with creative solutions for things and you're going to deal with problems that were not in your textbooks and are not standard cybersecurity things. And you can't think about cybersecurity as the most important thing either. When I see a lot of people dip their toes into industrial cybersecurity, what they end up doing is they end up like doing vulnerability assessment on an industrial device and going, oh, it's insecure. It's got some vulnerabilities. Yeah, they're really vulnerable. They're made yep. to be that. So when you hit the button on the wall, the, the machine stops. Just goes straight from here to they here. Yeah, made right, to right. Be simple. The protocols are made to be simple. When you tell them a command, they do the command because they need to do that command when they're issued the command. Yep. That's how they're engineered. That's more important than cybersecurity in a vacuum. 
What we care about in this space is consequences. We care about what would happen. What is the worst day ever here and what could cause it? How do we prevent that? There's a lot of those mitigations in place already because there's maintenance problems. There's human error. We try to keep those fires from happening and people being injured by machines and environmental contamination. We try to prevent all those things from happening in these industrial processes, but now we have to think about potential cyber causes as well. Um, people purposefully tampering with systems. Um, so You've got to be able to think about those consequences first. You've really got to take a real big 180 in your thinking um, from caring about cybersecurity in a vacuum. Again, what vulnerabilities are on this device? Well, okay, it's good to know because you might need to build some mitigations around that device. But really, the question is, what, what can catch on fire? You have to think about that. Mm -hmm. What could be done to catch this on fire? What mitigations are in place to prevent that from happening? And would they be effective? And would me doing cybersecurity stuff potentially catch things on fire? Um, so you could have a whole, as an example of this, you could have an entire massive industrial network. The entire thing is infected with Configure. Every single Windows computer is infected with Configure. They're all running Windows XP. And you know every computer has malware on it. Mm -hmm. But it has been doing that for 10 years and it is not causing an impact to those computer systems. Mm -hmm. And your alternative there is bringing them down at $16 million an hour. Yeah. What are you going to do? Well, you are going to leave Configure on there until you have a major maintenance window and you have vendor confirmation and you have a project plan for what you're going to do about that. You might leave it for another five years um, infected with Configure. And that is such a paradigm shift in thinking. So that's the first thing is like, you've got to be creative and adaptable and you've got to have that shift in thinking to consequence minded over cybersecurity, whiz bang, techie stuff. Um, and then the next thing, um, you can learn some industrial protocols like Modbus, that's fine. It's good to understand how those work. Um, but really more importantly is understand how processes work. Understand how mm. physical processes, like if you work for an electrical distribution company, go work shadow an operator for a while. Mm -hmm. Learn how they do stuff. Learn what they care about. Um, that is going to teach you more than, you know, learning some random protocol for three years. Um, learn how, learn to think about how stuff works. My job is an episode of how stuff works. Every single week, I learn how a new industrial process works, like how are eggs packaged and what can go wrong? How is fertilizer made? Um, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, how to train mm -hmm. signaling function. Like every yeah. week I have to learn something else like that. So you really need to start thinking about processes, systems of systems and how they function, what can go wrong, what the hazards are, what the mitigations are. So you don't need that thinking more than specific techie things. You can learn a new protocol. That's okay. Um, you can do that. You can learn how a software, a piece of software has its ladder logic programmed. You can learn that later. You need those fundamental means of thinking about these problems to be good at this job. Now, beyond that, my uh, CEO, Rob Lee, who's a SANS instructor, wrote the ICS curriculum for several courses, has a blog, and he has a blog on getting started in ICS. Mm -hmm. with It's just a big link page of, of stuff. It's quite good. He does keep it up to date. Um, and there's a lot of different resources for all kinds of different industrial technologies. But again, focus on the methodologies of thinking about these systems and systems of systems and their hazards and their mitigations before you launch into three years on a techie project on exploit research on a PLC. Mm -hmm. I promise you the PLC will be vulnerable. It will absolutely be vulnerable. And that's good to know. But it's not the primary area of focus. Is is the process vulnerable? Yeah. Yeah. No. It, I, 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 wow. You, you blew you blew my mind. And um, but also I I I, I like the, the 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 increased understanding here that how much of ICS is about physical defense and physical security in the way that we think of it with regard to like a CISSP degree or whatever, where you need to know like the locks on the door work or the the fire you know fire alarms or the sprinkler system work and things like that. Um, so I guess I want to move a little bit further on that to uh, getting started in this space, because, again, this seems like, uh, you know, you would need to have a, a very sort of thick set of qualifications to feel like you're you're going to be able to work in this space. And as someone who, uh, you know, like to build things and break things and and stuff like that, what for the future sort of build and break 
kids that are happening right now, what what would you recommend that they build and break and show and document that would make them, uh, you know, good candidates for this type of work? Like I said, the most valuable thing you can do is learn how industrial processes work. And you could get mm -hmm. that a multitude of ways. You could job shadow if you work in an organization that does manufacturing or does power generation or does oil and gas. See if you can get a month long job shadow exchange with somebody in your operations or, or system engineering on the process side of things. Um, see if you can get some shadowing in. Um, that's mm -hmm. going to be the most valuable learning experience for you. If you're not, if you're in college, consider taking some industrial engineering courses, mm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, see if you can take some of those classes, um, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, those will serve you very, very well. Um, you know, so um, that's something to consider as well if you're still in school. Um, if you're not and you don't have access to those things, I mean, pick a vertical and pick an era. You know, industrial cybersecurity is as big a space as cybersecurity is. You don't just like do industrial cybersecurity. I do industrial incident response. Like right. I am not an expert on like um, industrial risk assessment and management. I have colleagues yeah. who are like... I'm not an, an expert in industrial pen testing. I have colleagues who are like, it is a big space because there's every vertical is different. They all use different technologies and protocols from different eras. They're all operated differently. The processes are different. And then also there's eras like 80s technology is very different than 2010s technology. So mm -hmm. pick somewhere to start. If you're going this alone, don't just be like, I'm going to learn ICS. Be like, I'm going to learn about trains in America made in the 1990s, you know, pick mm -hmm. something and stick to it. I'm going to yep. learn about signals on trains for a year. Okay, do that and focus on cybersecurity for that. If you think that's interesting, like find, I tell this about to anybody who wants to get into cybersecurity, but find something to focus on because it is a big space and you can't learn all of it. Wow, that's awesome! Thank you. That's like the best advice I've heard in a long time. And and I I, I think I'm hoping our our listeners are taking notes right now. But um, I want to uh, turn over to um, current events here because uh, my friend Andrew uh, recommended you, and he will uh, skin me alive if I don't mention this. But you are going to be the keynote speaker at this year's Blue Team Con event here in Chicago, uh, which takes place Friday through Sunday, August 25th through 27th, and I believe it's open to the public on 26 27th. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and uh, doing two things there. I will be keynoting and I will be running the career clinic the entire weekend. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I, I want to start out with the um, uh, mm -hmm. the keynote here. Your, your topic is, uh, we're all scared to 10 years of lessons from cybersecurity mentorship. So without giving away all your uh, trade secrets, can you tell us more about this topic and how it relates to the conference? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I do a lot of mentoring. I do clinics for like resumes and interview skills for cybersecurity people who are trying to change jobs or mm -hmm. students who are coming out of the military, et cetera. And I've been doing that for about a decade now, running clinics. And then over the last year, I've started opening up a Calendly and letting people sign up for one-on-one -on -one assistance with me as well. I'm currently backlogged two months. Um, but there's been a huge demand for it. Apparently, more need, people need to do that because people need the help. And I have a lot, I see a lot of people who are in every stage of their career in cybersecurity, from thinking about maybe getting in in high school to been in it for 25 years and have a problem they need to talk over as somebody, somebody. And I see them all. And um, I think it's time now after 10 years, and I've written some blogs about this and things, but I think it's time to start talking about the commonalities, the things that I see all the time that are the things people don't admit to one another, that are the ubiquitous problems in this space that everybody has and nobody wants to talk about. And then the mistakes that I hear about people making over and over and over again and how to resolve those and not do those things. So I'm doing this talk at both Blue Team Con in Chicago, and then I'll be doing it as a keynote at Wild West Hackenfest um, mm -hmm. in South Dakota. Uh, okay. later on in the fall. Um, so if you can make one of those, that would be lovely. Um, I don't believe either will be recorded. So so do try to make one of them. Um, and I, I will be trying in my 45 minutes or so to give all the information I can about what I've learned from talking to lots of people about their problems in getting jobs, changing jobs, deciding what to do in their career in cybersecurity. 
Thank, that's awesome. Um, so for our listeners, I mean, have you been to Blue Team Con before? Do you have what what, um, what are some of the activities that uh, will be on hand this year? And are, are there things you're looking forward to about this event? Every year uh, since they were founded, I've come and run the career and resume review clinic with my my pal, Miss um, mm-hmm. Bat is her handle. Mm-hmm. Um, she has a wonderful framework out, for framework she developed out there on GitHub for how to run these clinics. If you're interested mm-hmm. in running one somewhere else, but we've always run Blue Team Con together. We have a two day workshop, lots of volunteers. It's all bunched out of our pockets, and it may be some donations from from organizations there. And we basically have volunteers come in and meet with people one-on-one, go through their resumes, talk to them. And we run that for nine, 10 hours straight each day. And uh, we are full usually. So um, we have sign up coming up soon. So so that's one thing that's offered at Blue Team Con. So I think that's fantastic. But there's a lot of other things that go on at Blue Team Con. So there's wonderful speakers. It's education focus. there's another conference in, in Chicago called ThoughtCon every other year, which is fantastic mm-hmm. as well, which is more of like the red team hackery side of things. They're gotcha. both terrific conferences. Everybody in Chicago should make both of them. Um, but the Blue Team Con is, of course, more defensive oriented and more student oriented. So yep. the talks are a little bit more focused on, on educational for defensive cybersecurity. There's also a mental health village, which is wonderful, focusing on mental health of cybersecurity professionals, which I think is fantastic because there's a lot of substance abuse problems and mental health problems that exist in our field that we don't talk about a lot. Um, There's a lot of nice vendor programs and vendor booths available. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of educational programs running during the conference as well. So other ways to learn about cybersecurity, um, it is a community conference. It is not a, uh, corporate conference at all. It is operated by volunteers in the, mostly the Chicago and Midwest cybersecurity community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the board is fantastic. I can't say enough good things about it. And uh, yeah, exciting. I'm, I'm going to try and make it there as well. That, that, that sounds like a, a ton of fun. So uh, as we uh, start to wrap up today, can you talk about your work to bring new and more wide ranging generation of cyber and incident response professionals into the industry? I mean, you know, we've, we've been talking about, uh, you know, bringing in, you know, the, the, the new generation and lowering the barrier entry and stuff. But uh, in terms of bringing in sort of um, more diverse, uh, you know, candidates and, and, um, and so forth. What advice do you have for anyone listening to this who might feel, uh, you know, intimidated or pushed out a, a around this type of work, but, you know, could really bring in so many new innovations and solutions into the space? And 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 what would you have to say to sort of companies to encourage them to sort of make it more welcoming so that each, yeah. you know, diverse candidate that comes in doesn't feel like they have to, you know, constantly fight a war against, uh, you know, toxicity and so mm-hmm. forth? So first of all, the job hunters, there is a place for every personality type and every person in cybersecurity. It's wonderful that there's so many niches now because there's place for introverts, there's place for for extroverts, for people who like to focus on one problem, for people who like chaos. Mm -hmm. There's there's a job for you in cybersecurity and find mentorship to figure out what that is for you. Um, In terms of diversity, things have gotten a lot better in the last 25 years since I've been in IT. that doesn't mean that they're all better. There are still toxic people out there and you will have to be tough sometimes. You have to stick up for yourself, find a good mentor and understand when to have a discussion about when to fight versus when to defer. Um, It's not easy sometimes. I wish I could get on these podcasts and talk about it and say, hey, always stick up for yourself in a visible, loud way in meetings, or, you know, always just quit your job if somebody harasses you, or always take stuff to HR. That's not always the case. I wish it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish we lived in a perfect universe where all those tools worked, where mental health was a priority for organizations, where um, commitment to diversity was real, and sometimes it isn't. So sometimes it's time to walk away from an organization and sometimes you can't because you need to make a paycheck. Find a good mentor, find a good support structure. There are a lot of good people in this field. There are some bad ones. We try to warn people about the bad ones. They still exist. Sometimes they're quite famous. Find your community, your DEF CON local group, your city sec group in Chicago. That's Burbsec Network is wonderful. 
There are, are more people, more good people out there than bad people. So find that support structure so that when you face those bad days, especially as a diverse candidate, when things are not going right, when things are unjust, that you have people to go to for advice, potential different jobs, um, for suggestions on how to handle things legally, um, you will have to be tough sometimes. I will not lie and say that things are super easy now, that sexism has gone away, that transphobia has gone away, that racism has gone away, that ageism has gone away. No, they still absolutely exist more in some niches of cybersecurity than others. And you need to be tough and have a good support network for your mental health and for your career. That's the best advice I can give you. Yeah. And and Um, I'm sorry, please. Oh, well, I was just going to go into what I tell the organizations, but does that Please. make sense? Yeah, no, this is fantastic. No, that's, that's exactly right. Now, what were you going to say about the organization? To the Sorry. hiring managers out there, I've, I've said this a thousand times, and I'm not the only one who said this, but you cannot care about diversity and name only. Having a pseudo diversity board in your organization is not adequate, especially if it's all a bunch of straight white guys. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to make a real commitment to expanding the pipeline into cybersecurity, which means looking for non-standard educational backgrounds Mm -hmm. and investing in people who might not have gone to the best college in cybersecurity, you need to make a real investment in diversity. It is not just having a diversity and inclusion board. It's how you write your job postings. It's where you put your job postings. It is the advantages that you give to people who don't have those non-standard backgrounds. And it is the tools and the resources and the protection that you give those diverse people in your organization once they are already in it. It is respecting their their you know gender identity. It's respecting their race. It's respecting their you know you know having kids, not having kids, their age, their educational background. There's a lot of different types of diversity out there. Um, their religious needs. Um, actually, making appropriate concessions to those things and making sure that your employees respect people for who they are. So I see a lot of, you know, putting up the pride flags during June, you know, in organizations accounts and those same organizations don't really do any support for people who are being harassed because they're queer. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's uh, something you cannot do in name only. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, no, that's a that's a lot, and that we're gonna have to just keep saying that until uh, until it gets through. Um, so, in conclusion, I just want to wrap up with uh, uh, some info for our listeners. If they want to know more about Leslie Carhart or Dragos or Blue Team Con, uh, where can they go online? All right, um, for Blue Team Con, Blue Team Con has a social media presence on pretty much every site. I think there's a lot more than there used to be, but they're pretty much on everything. And again, please come out and see us. I believe there's a student ticket rate. Um, please come out and see us if you can in Chicago. Um, it should be a great time. I'm happy to say hi and chat with you as my schedule doing a bunch of stuff allows. You're going to be busy. Um, yeah, it's going to be a busy weekend, but it always is. And it's a lot of fun. Um, in terms of Dragos, um, it's dragos.com. And we do have some job postings open. Um Again, in a wide range of things from software development to cybersecurity. So check those out. Um, yeah. Definitely check out our services and products. I would love that too. Yeah, of um, course. In terms of me, um, I am Hacks for Pancakes, the number four Hacks for Pancakes on a multitude of social media. I use Mastodon the most, but I'm also on Blue Sky and Threads and Instagram. I try to get the word out. I have a blog. It's uh, linked on all my socials, but it's tosiphony.net. Um, and I'm all over YouTube. You can search for my name. It's L-E-S-L-E-Y is my name, C-A-R-H-A-R-T. Everybody spells it wrong. And you can search for years, decades of talks from me on cybersecurity and industrial cybersecurity on YouTube. Awesome. And, I, and I'm going to do that as soon as we're done here. I, wanna, I want the whole story. Uh, we've already had a great conversation and I could talk to you for hours more. But uh, Leslie, thank you so much for taking us through these many facets of your life and career. And it was a real pleasure to talk to you. It was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. 
My pleasure. Uh, and thank uh, thank you all who have been listening to and watching the Cyborg podcast on an unprecedented scale. The numbers just keep climbing and we're so glad to have you all along for the ride. So uh, before you go, I want to invite all of you, our listeners to visit infosecinstitute.com slash free to get a whole bunch of free stuff for Cyborg listeners, including our new cybersecurity awareness training series, Work Bites which features a host of fantastical employees, including a zombie, a vampire, a princess, a pirate, making security mistakes and hopefully learning from them. Uh, and I know uh, because I just recorded a promo for it, we just added our newest security awareness toolkit, which is free. Uh, and it's all it's called protect, uh, Secure Your Screens. And it's all uh, based around movies and TV. And it looks like a total blast. So also um, grab if you're at infosecinstitute.com slash free, uh, get your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, ICS uh, security practitioner, and more. So lots to see, lots to do. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free. And yes, the link will be in the description below. Thank you once again to Leslie Carhart and Blue Team Con and Dragos Inc. And thank you all so much for watching and listening. And as always, we will speak to you next week. I know.